Think about the first time you put a puzzle together. Do you remember the experience of looking at the cover of the box to see the finished product? Perhaps you were excited because you could see the goal ahead of you and how beautiful that final completed puzzle would appear. But then you opened the box. At first you were fascinated and even curious. How could all of these tiny pieces fit together to form that picture of an ocean? Or even of these kitty cats? Or of this famous painting? You wondered how long it would take you. Time would pass. And then fascination turned to frustration. The pieces were so small and most of the time they wouldn't even fit together. Hours turned into days and you began to lose hope. Maybe you even asked for a little help. In many ways, understanding the ideas of language is very much like solving a puzzle. We have some notion of the finished product, but also lots of difficulty in fitting the pieces. In part two of our video series, we will begin looking at these pieces of language, and hopefully by the time we're finished, you'll begin to see how it can all come together. Welcome to an introduction to grammar. So let's review what we did last time. We discussed that the rules of grammar are similar to the rules of the road. Grammar provides order and structure to language. It provides benefits as well as potential consequences if we don't follow them. Grammar is a natural product of language, but with many created rules by people. And finally, we discussed the concepts of descriptive and prescriptive views of language. This week we're going to explore about how each individual part of speech fits together, which parts of speech can work together and which can't, how they interact with and or modify other words, and how they relate to each other in terms of location. Remember something important we mentioned in our introduction. Not every puzzle piece can fit together. Last week when discussing the major parts of speech, first we discussed the general form of the parts of speech, in other words, how they are created. And we said that in identifying the parts of speech, these are usually the words that contain meanings by themselves, and we refer to these as content ideas. We also looked at their general function, and the fact that their relationships are governed by basic rules that have to be mastered. Every part of speech has a set of ideas that help determine how they will interact with other words in the sentence. Some parts of speech will have more than one relationship, and a few only one. Also, it's important to remember that some parts of speech will never interact with each other. This is also a part of their function. As mentioned in the first video, grammatical relationships are governed by logic. So again, thinking about can these particular words go together? We also discussed location. Where in the relationship do these words go? For example, in talking about adjectives, we said that adjectives and their basic idea are that they describe the quantity and or quality of nouns. Because of this limited relationship, adjectives work only with nouns, but can have a few different possible locations when it comes to describing them. So look at these two examples. The first sentence was our original sentence from the first video. The brown fox jumped over the lazy dog quickly. 
The second example is a slightly modified sentence in which we've eliminated most of the information except for the first idea and changed it around a little bit. The fox is brown. Again, we used colors to determine different parts of speech. So if you recall, the word brown described the word fox, just like the word lazy describes the word dog. In the second example, you will notice that the word brown, even though it's not directly in front of the word fox, is describing the word fox. This particular relationship we refer to as the adjective complement of the sentence. If you will notice, the verb in this case is not an action verb, but a state of being verb. When we use states of being verbs, oftentimes the idea that follows is going to be what we call a complement. In this case, the complement is an adjective because it's going back to complement or basically to add more information with the noun. So in this case, the fox is brown. We can identify that brown is describing the word fox. So, when adjectives are directly describing nouns, they go in front of them. But we've just learned that adjectives can also go after a state of being verb. And again, these are words such as is, are, look, seem, feel. And they can serve as the complement of that state of being verb. As with any relationship, just like we learned last week, and as we're discovering this week, there must be some sort of limitations when it comes to fitting these pieces together. When adjectives directly describe a noun, they cannot be separated by any other word. And this way, this is a limitation. Adjectives are very fixed in their location in this type of relationship. So notice, for example, in our first example, we said that this sentence is correct. But look at these other examples. What if I change the order of the words fox and brown? Notice that the word brown is still close to the word fox, but as we've learned, part of its relationship is the fact that it has to go in front of the word to describe it. So in this case, this sentence would be wrong. Again, the word the, which oftentimes we associate with uh, pointing to nouns like the fox, it would seem like a word that you would want to put next to the word fox. But, as we've just learned, if you're going to add an adjective to a sentence to directly describe a noun, it needs to be right in front of it. So in this case, this example is also wrong. Now these are things you may already know. Perhaps you know them intuitively, but you've never really thought about them before. Why exactly does it work this way? When looking at the adjective as the complement of the sentence, again, we notice that the first example was correct. This is possible. But again, we run into the same problems when we try to change the order. Even though the word brown and fox are close to each other, this is not how the relationship works when we use a state of being verb and an adjective complement. Again, this one we realize that the word the is also an idea that's fairly limited in its relationship. And we'll talk more about this in future videos. But for now, we recognize that the word the would need to go in front of the word fox, and that the word brown would need to follow the complement, uh, follow the uh, state of being verb. And finally, we recognize that this sentence, even though the word brown, again, is next to the word fox, that is not how the order works. Now, in the next few slides, we're going to begin to look at what we call basic parts of speech profiles. So it is very important that you study these next four slides. And these four slides will also be posted at the bottom of the uh, page so that you can look at them a little more carefully on your own time. Let's begin with a noun profile. On the left side, we're describing the basic form and the ideas that we associate with a noun. On the right side are kind of referring to its general function. How does it work? And talking about its location. And again, I'm not going to read through all of this information, 
but it is important to recognize some of the things we discussed last week and some of the new things we're learning this week. For example, nouns can be singular or plural. They can be countable or uncountable. But notice on the right side, they're general relationships. They do work with verbs. They can be modified by adjectives. But notice there are some rules and limitations. For example, when they work with verbs, they must agree in that when it's singular, the verb itself must reflect that it's a singular form. When nouns are plural, verbs must also recognize that they're plural. Another limitation we discussed in last week's video is that nouns cannot work with adverbs in any way. Now let's talk about verbs. Again, verbs have lots of information that we won't be able to discuss now, but the basic idea that we've learned so far is that nouns provide the action or a state of being of something in a sentence. They can reflect the time, the voice, and even the mood. And again, if these are ideas you're not familiar with, we will discuss them in the future in, in future videos. Again, certain functions we can associate with verbs. For example, we have nouns, adjectives. Verbs can even be modified with adverbs. Of course, there are some rules and limitations. One rule that we're going to discuss later with, when it comes to verbs is the fact that some verbs will require what we call an object, and others will not. Adjectives we've discussed already in that they describe and the quantity of something. And yes, uh, once again, they are a major part of speech. Adjectives generally have two possible locations, before a noun and after a state of being verb. And of course, we've discussed the rules and limitations already. Adverbs are probably the trickiest major part of speech in that they can go in many different places in a sentence. Adverbs can modify the action of something. They can also modify other adjectives and even other adverbs. They work with verbs. And notice, of course, as we've stressed before, they generally cannot modify nouns directly. Something to keep in mind. It's important to study these profiles because they will help provide a solid foundation for future grammatical explorations. But please keep in mind, the profiles I've just shown you are very incomplete. We will continue to add to them as we go along in this series. And again, I mentioned that copies of these profiles can be found at the bottom of this page for your reference. Now, in our original example, we already identified adjectives. And certainly, we look at both of these sentences and say to ourselves, these are fairly basic sentences, fairly simple. What about if we wanted to add more information to the sentence? Well, for example, are there other possible relationships adjectives could have? Well, in, this, in these two sentences, the answer is no. Not in the way that they are written. But let's go back and think for a moment. Do adjectives in general have relationships with other words? Well, again, adjectives, as we discussed, directly describe nouns or can describe nouns through the state of being verb. But if you recall, when looking at an adverb, adverbs have relationships with adjectives because they can modify them. So in this case, we can add more information if we consider the fact that if we're going to introduce some adverbs to describe something, one possibility is adding an adverb to describe the adjectives that are already there. So again, notice what happens. If we add adverbs in front of the adjectives, they can add more information. 
So in this case, now instead of saying the brown fox, we can say the extremely brown fox or the very lazy dog. In our second example, we could say the fox is really brown. So we can add adverbs in front of the adjectives and that will add more information to the sentences. Now it's important to keep in mind that our two original sentences didn't necessarily need more information, but they were possible because adverbs can modify adjectives. And this is important to keep in mind because as we begin to look at more and more complicated sentences, we need to remember that these sentences themselves perhaps didn't need extra information, but they did add information that could possibly fit into the sentences. Of course, other things we have to remember. We, st we stated in the first video that there are other tests we have to perform in order to see if the information we added makes sense. So that kind of relates to the first idea. Our additions were logical. In other words, when I added the words, the sentence still made sense. And of course, we placed the adverbs in the right locations. If we had placed the adverbs somewhere else, the sentence probably would not have made as much sense. In our next video, we will begin to explore more about these possibilities and which ideas are required to achieve a grammatically correct sentence. But for now, the most important things to remember are the key idea of logic. Do these words make sense together? Location. Where do these words go in relation to each other? A new concept to think about is purpose. Does every word here have at least one relationship? In other words, does every word have a purpose? And possibilities. Is it possible to add more ideas? And what happens when we do? Now, some of you may already be familiar with the concept of suffixes, but let's begin as if we didn't know what this idea was. First off, knowing the form and function of a word, as we stressed in the first video and here today, is essential in understanding grammar. But perhaps there are other ways that we could more quickly identify a word's part of speech. Now, let's go back to our original sentence. And let's just use the knowledge that we learned in the first video to help identify these major parts of speech again. So again, let's just start with nouns. If you remember, nouns are people, places, things, or ideas. So again, we said that the fox and dog are both nouns. They're both things. So that's great. Now let's look at verbs. Can you find the verb in the sentence? All right, good job. Every sentence must have at least one verb and a noun to go with the verb. Now let's find some adjectives. We've talked a lot about adjectives today. Can you remember where they are? Nice. Now let's see if there are any adverbs in the sentence. Excellent. So we have identified all of the major parts of speech using what we know so far of form and function. However, could there have been a faster way to help in this process? Obviously, recognizing the form and even the function can be helpful, but sometimes that might take a lot of time. Is there extra information that we could use? Well, if you've noticed, here I've underlined some things the endings of these particular words. These parts of the words we could call the suffix. And again, notice jumped, I've underlined ed. Lazy, I've underlined the, word, the uh, letter y. And the word quickly, I've underlined ly.
So what is a suffix? Well, a suffix is a change to a word that helps indicate it's part of speech. Not every word has a suffix, but many do. Do you know why? Well, the big reason is because English itself, as a language, has been influenced by many other languages over the years, especially the languages of Latin and Greek. These languages used word parts, or what we refer to as morphemes, to change the part of speech of a word. Now, English has incorporated many of these ideas in much the same way. For example, we took the adjective quick and added the ending ly to form the adverb, quickly. In a way, suffixes are like puzzle pieces, since they can break off of a word as a separate idea of meaning, and they can fit only with certain words. Certainly this list is not comprehensive, but here are some common suffix patterns that you may already be aware of. For example, to create a noun, one idea is to take a verb and add er or or. For example, in the words teacher or professor. To form a verb, one way we can do this is to take an adjective and add en, such as weaken or sicken. With adjectives, we can take nouns and add the endings full or able and come up with playful or knowledgeable. And of course we've mentioned the adverb idea already, and this is perhaps one of the most consistent patterns, is taking an adjective and adding ly, such as in the example quickly. Suffixes of course bring with them specific ideas that help identify characteristics of that part of speech. For example, when we mention that many nouns can be singular or plural, one way to do this is to add a suffix, adding a final s or a final es to create a plural noun form. For example, car becomes cars. Verbs also can add an s or es, but their meaning would be different, of course. This in, th in this case, it would be to indicate a third person singular idea. We also add a suffix ed to form a regular past tense or past participle of a word, such as in walked. And even adding ing to create a present participle, often used for the present progressive, such as I am walking. To learn more about suffixes, visit our grammar resources link on our class page. So let's review. As we mentioned in our introduction, when we look at a complete puzzle, it's often difficult to tell just how exactly the individual pieces fit together. Of course, the goal of putting a puzzle together is to finish with one smooth, continuous image. So let's review. As we mentioned in our introduction, when we look at a complete puzzle, it's difficult to tell just how exactly the individual pieces fit together. Because the goal of putting a puzzle together is to finish with one smooth, continuous image. Now, as you can see here in Van Gogh's A Starry Night, it looks like its original painting. But actually, this is a picture of a puzzle of A Starry Night. It's only when we break the puzzle down do we notice exactly how the pieces are made to fit together. As you can see here, as we look in the smaller pieces, it begins to take on more of the idea of a puzzle. Of course, putting a puzzle back together, on the other hand, can be a frustrating experience. Learning about grammar is much like trying to put the puzzle back together after you have already seen the final result.
Thanks for watching this video. See you next time for part 3, Learning the Moves.